Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, a regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining us on the desk at the NASDAQ market site, we have Jacqueline O'Flanagan, head of financial services, America's NASDAQ listed and NASDAQ 100 index constituent, Microsoft, as well as Dr. Christos Makritis, associate research professor at the W.P. Carey School of Business at the Arizona State University, as well as senior researcher at Gallup. And remotely, we have Barb Morgan, Chief Product and Technology Officer of Temenos. We're here to discuss the biggest cybersecurity and innovation risks in financial services and how to address those concerns. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Barb, let's kick this off with you um, and discuss cybercrime. It is a growing concern for banks. How is this shaping their technology investments and to better protect customers? Yeah, cybersecurity has become one of the number one concerns for our banks everywhere. You know, we spend a lot of time talking with CEOs, chief risk officers, CIOs of our banks, and you know, they they really said the the growing concern it's a top challenge for them. Um, we actually released a global Temno survey recently, and it showed 85% of banks are saying it is their top challenge, and more than three quarters are expecting it to be even more critical in the next few years. So how that's translating into their investment decisions, banks are prioritizing moving to a modern core platform at speed, speed we haven't seen before. And the reason behind that is these platforms give them faster updates, better scalability, but most importantly, it gives them stronger built-in security. You know, when we look at our trusted hyperscalers, um, partners like Microsoft, who, who's one of our key strategic partners, they get that built-in security from day one. And when we talk to the uh, talk to our banks, you know, they really talk about protecting their, it's not just about protecting their systems, but it's protecting the trust with their customers. Because if you think about a banking relationship, the foundation of that relationship is with trust. Yeah, it certainly is. And Jacqueline, it's interesting because Microsoft, you have a unique vantage point across a number of industries. How are you seeing cyber threats evolve specifically to banking? No, and I absolutely love the question and love the comment from Barb because Microsoft runs on trust. And so Microsoft's unprecedented scale gives us unmatched visibility across and processing over 78 trillion security signals daily from billions of Windows endpoints, cloud service, uh, and diverse ecosystems and customers ranging from governments to large financial institutions to large consumers and all the way down to end users as well. And the unique vantage point enables us to, de to detect uh, emerging attack patterns weeks and months before they become uh, widespread allowing financial institutions to implement defense proactively rather than reactively. And similar to Barb, uh, Microsoft actually launched last week our digital defense report for 2025. Mm -hmm. And so there we actually dive into financial services is actually one of the top 10 industries most frequently impacted by cyber threats in the last six months. And so, as you can tell, this is dramatically changing the landscape for all of these institutions, but for their end users as well. Yeah. Um, Christos, let's talk about the recognition for cyber security. We, we know it's important for companies, but is it really that important? What's the data saying? Yeah, I, it's uh, clearly it's um, something that executives rank as one of the top issues. Um, the challenge is that every organization has short run priorities that they are focusing on. And sometimes these longer run issues around the health, the, the integrity of the uh, underlying digital infrastructure is uh, pushed out a little bit later. And so uh, one of the papers that I have with uh, a faculty friend, Tim Liu at University of Utah, we look at vulnerabilities and how they're priced in, in assets. And in particular, we're looking at equities. And so what we find is for the median firm in the Fortune 500, it's costing about $90 million a year um, to have these vulnerabilities. And so that's why um, the point that Jacqueline was making and just about taking these health checks of your network, figuring out what is vulnerable and then patching it, rectifying it, that also saves money. Even though it might not be as flashy as some of the things that get talked about in the news, right. it's one of the lurking things in the background. Well, of course, I mean, your reputation is priceless, right? Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to trust is, as Jacqueline and Barbara were saying, especially for financial institutions. Yeah, and, and I just to double click on that point is that more and more the U.S. economy is moving towards intangible capital knowledge services. Those are precisely the areas where trust matters as opposed to as much in a, a commodities based market where it's more pure manufacturing. And so I think this this issue is only going to become more important. So uh, Barb, let's address some of um, the legacy problems. Do, do banks have it when it comes to fighting financial crime? 
Yeah, legacy systems were they were never built for today's speed, but more importantly, the sophistication of the attacks. And so when you think about where banks are spending the majority of their technology budgets, they're just trying to keep those systems running. And, you know, as, as we were hearing, the outdated cores make it harder to patch those vulnerabilities and quickly respond to new fraud patterns. So the risk of delay is real. Um, it's exposure for the banks. And so when banks think about modernizing their core, it's not just a technology upgrade anymore. It's truly becoming a security imperative and how they keep that trust with their customers. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up, um, what you see in terms of a risk with delaying modernization. It's not only just a security risk, but you also don't want to hinder innovation as well, being stymied by you know um, not being able to move on because your infrastructure isn't uh, up to date. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, speaking of modernizing infrastructure, how is Microsoft helping banks to be more agile and resistant? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Resilient, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> no, it's a great question. And banks uh, of today aren't just thriving. Um, they're actually starting to digitize. And what we're seeing through our landscape is they're AI operated, but human led. And so what we're starting to see emerge on our side is what we're referring to as the frontier firm. And so many of these organizations have moved beyond proof of concepts into AI embedded inside their organizations on a daily basis, moving through overall engineered process, start to finish across silos. And now it's actually push, pushing across industries. And so when we think about the interoperability, not only within a large financial services organization like a bank, but across the industry at whole, this is where we have to think about the interoperability, but the resilience of the ecosystem. And so our integrated approach to AI solutions are transforming how banks handle the flood of some of these signals. Um, Microsoft Security Copilot and Azure AI help institutions identify real threats um, from noise, processing millions of alerts and surfacing almost 1% um, that matter most. As we think about helping achieve privacy and resilience through AI powered integra integrated solutions um, that work together seamlessly, this integrated approach means banks don't have to choose between innovation, but they can think about protection because it's already baked into the services and solutions that we provide today at scale. How is generative AI influencing cybersecurity risk? Because it is a game of 4D chess. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of upsides. There's a big debate about will Gen AI uh, empower offensive cyber capabilities more than the defensive parts? And so what that means is that the cost of actually doing a cyber attack are, are potentially much lower because anyone can use Gen AI to write the code that is malicious and gets into a network. And so there was a really nice report that was just released um, by uh, Winona, Winona um, Berenson and Sergey Bretas at Dartmouth. And what they basically did is they held a big round table of a lot of different experts and they, they uh, found that the private sector is lacking some of the capabilities to actually go out and do more R&D over offensive cyber solutions. And the reason being is that a lot of times venture capital is afraid of uh, empowering and giving to the smaller companies. And so there's certainly this kind of uh, this 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 vulnerability within the ecosystem to create solutions. And so this is one area where where I think that there's a lot of room for growth and uh, more collaboration between venture capital community startups and uh, how do we kind of thread the needle on on gen AI risks? I think there's it is nearly impossible to overstate the importance of academia and R and D because that, that's where you see these you know companies it's incubators you're willing to share the research it's not quite as proprietary as, as private companies um, and I think you you cannot overstate the importance and, and even being able to provide the data and the empirical research to support those theses is critical yeah. there. Yeah, and I mean, that's one of the reasons why in academia you don't see as much research in uh, areas of cyber, just because data has been hard to come by. So uh, Jacqueline's like tempting me with the uh, data that uh, that Microsoft has access to, and uh, maybe one of these days there'll be uh, opportunity for collaboration. But it's incredible hearing about what's what's possible. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, Barb, how is Temenos leveraging AI within its core banking platforms to help banks proactively detect and also respond to fraud and cyber threats? Yeah, you know, at Temnos, we're embedding AI directly into our core banking platform. What we're finding is um, our, our customers really want it to be not an add-on, but part of the fabric. And so that means partnering with, with companies like Microsoft. It means partnering with, you know, some of the startups and, and what's out there and making sure that, that we're bringing that in in a safe and secure way, but really building it into the fabric, meaning that every transaction, every compliance check, every security risk, is continually being analyzed in real time. And so take, for instance, we recently released a product called Financial Crime Mitigation AI Agent. 
And what we've seen, we worked with the tier one bank in developing it, and it's reduced their false positives and sanction screening from as high as 8% down to 2%. And so that's fewer false positives. It's fewer, you know, it's faster investigations, but it's greater confidence for our customers and for their end customers. So how do you see agentic AI in general evolving within banking operations? And what safeguards are needed to ensure responsible deployment? It feels like we finally sort of got our heads wrapped around um, generative AI, and now you have this introduction of, you know, of another enhanced technology. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing agentic AI is really redefining how banks operate. And so we're moving into this era where you see intelligence systems, not just analyzing the data, but acting on it and making sure that we can put guardrails, strong guardrails, where we have governance and transparency and explainability into the process. And we're giving our customers choices. So allowing them be, to be able to put a person at different checkpoints along the way so that they build that confidence. Um, but there's definitely a potential for automated controls, faster fraud response, new levels of customer personalization. And so we talk about, you know, with our customers, we say it's AI with accountability. So every decision must be traceable. It must be auditable. We must augment human judgment and never replace it fully. And when you get that balance right, that human plus AI with governed and ethical, you unlock both security and innovation. And that's the that's the future that we're seeing ahead and what our customers are really looking for. Jacqueline, what are some of the most promising use cases of agentic AI that you're seeing um, emerge across the Americas? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And we're kind of sitting at the forefront of this massive paradigm shift. And so when we think about large financial institutions that are using this, they're using this from anything from mortgage applications all the way through to uh, wealth, managed, wealth management and advisory. We're seeing it through to trade reconciliation on some ends. And so some of the largest institutions are really kind of pushing the needle. And what we're also starting to see is there's leaders and laggards emerge across the industry. Some of those leaders are really kind of taking this to the next level. And so they're looking at not only AI powered organizations, but agentic powered organizations as well. And so when we think about the evolution of AI plus human, AI's managing agents, multiple AI agents managing one another, we're starting to really see this true progression across the industry. And so, you know, when we think about some of the most recent announcements that we've made around partnerships or collaboration with Scotiabank and trade reconciliation um, and finance reconciliation, that's really some of the bigger areas. Um, but banks are really starting to dabble in this. And so where they've moved from POCs in the past, uh, AI is not just a concept anymore. Many of these organizations really need to grasp and embrace the change across the ecosystem and really start to look at what this means for them to bend the curve on innovation, to think about new client experiences and to really start to think about new revenue streams and long-term opportunities for their organization. How are you advising financial institutions that are hesitant to adopt agentic AI when you're thinking about control and transparency and understanding the risk? Yep. Uh, and so the way that we think about it for financial institutions hesitant about it, don't let the fear of risk become a barrier to progress. Mm -hmm. And so at Microsoft specifically, we have our own AI um, framework, but across all of the ecosystem, we try and work together on what this framework uh, supports and how we can work with clients to keep guardrails safe within their organization. And if I look at what Christoph said, kind of going back to the start, this really starts in thinking about this through the risk lens. Cyber is a part of every conversation as organizations try to protect themselves for the future. And so making sure that they have those guardrails in place from the board all the way down as they think about the evolution from AI today to the evolution to the frontier firm and the frontier industry is really critical in that juncture. I mean, it has to be a complete cultural shift. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, when we talk about cultural shift, it's people process change management. It's also about the scaling aspect, making sure that you're communicating from the top down on why you're making these changes. Early on, there were risks around, is this going to eliminate my job or anything like that? What we've seen is new jobs are emerging as a result of this. And so I think organizations have to change their mindset. It's a culture shift, it's a mind, mindset shift. Um, but as we start to think about the future, the opportunities are endless for many of these firms. Yeah. Chris, so I'm gonna wrap up and discuss digital assets as an example, expanding um, into the banking sectors. We see more integration there and how that impacts cybersecurity risk. Because part of that ethos is, permission and transparency and um, traceability. So how is that impacting the cyber 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of these emerging technologies, and we sometimes think about them in silos. You think quantum, you think cyber, AI, et cetera, and digital assets, but they're all very intertwined. And so when you think about where does a breakdown in trust oftentimes happen in an organization, it's because maybe you forget about a certain asset. Like maybe there is a certain port that you was instituted 10 years ago, and you just forgot that it's actually connected to the network or a printer. And so what digital assets in particular blockchain enables is to have that digital paper trail and to have a much more secure link. And so you have that providence when there are transactions. So I'd say blockchain offers the uh, promise of having a little bit more security because there is a, a link um, across all the different assets that are connected. And I want to distinguish this from like the permissionless when you hear uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, that's a permissionless blockchain. Here we're talking about organizations adopting blockchain for inventory right. management, for transactions, et cetera. So I think, and, and then I'll just lastly kind of double click on the point about change management and just say all of this requires a cultural transformation. You can't just blop technology into an organization and say, well, that's, that's it. We're washing our hands. We're done. No, it requires changing the way that we think and the processes therein. Right, but I mean also one of the largest vulnerabilities is the front line, which are people. Whether it's without mal intent, it's, um, you know, that's, that's where really where the vulnerabilities lie. Yeah. And it has to come from the board to the C-suite all the way through to you know the front yeah. lines and, and um, understanding that it is a cyber first mentality, whether you're modeling, producing, engineering, yeah, well, I mean, just to really pick up on that point is that sometimes we make a big deal about all the zero day events, the really flashy things that make a lot of the headlines, but many breaches, many vulnerabilities are actually just associated with um, clumsy mistakes that are made because we're not paying as much attention as maybe we should have. And so that, as you said, it needs to start at the top in that culture of just being really careful, simple things, multi-factor authentication, et cetera. Just doing that across the organization can have a really big effect. All right, appreciate everyone's insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. And thanks for joining me for Market Site. I'm Joe Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.